ready for you too. Yeah, cool. It's already recording. It's all yours. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, I acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, I acknowledge that this land is stolen and that sovereignty was never ceded and I encourage the members of parliament who we have in our audience tonight to work towards treaty, reparations and stolen generations compensation. I'm Nina Valens, uh, and I am here for the Victorian Women's Guild, which is a collective of women which was recently formed to promote women's rights and concerns in the state. Thank you all for coming. We have a diverse group of people here, members of parliament, media, feminists, women's libbers, um, and people who probably have come here expecting to oppose what we have to say. Uh, and it's great that everyone is here committed to respectful discussion on such a difficult topic. Thank you for coming. We're very excited to bring you this talk. We've had a lot of people very keen um, to hear this and lots of emails from people saying um, how grateful they are that we're having this discussion about the Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Amendment Bill. We'll hear from our speakers first, they each have 10 minutes to speak, and during that time you will be able to email to an address, um, to this address, uh, your questions, and they will be compiled and then sent through to me, a sort of balanced selection of questions will be sent through to me to pose at the end, we'll have 15 minutes for questions. Currently the law in Victoria um, says that uh, if you want to change the sex which is recorded on your birth certificate, you must have lived in Victoria for 12 months and you need statutory declarations from two medical professionals testifying that you have undergone sex reassignment surgery. So very, very invasive surgery. This bill which is before Parliament at the moment, if passed, would allow people to change the sex which is recorded on their birth certificate on the basis of a simple statutory declaration saying that they believe their sex to be as nominated. An adult would also need a supporting statement from someone who has known them for at least 12 months. Children uh, would need their adults to apply on their behalf and they need a supporting statement from either a doctor, a psychologist or someone from an undefined registered, uh, prescribed class of persons. There are also extra requirements for people who are prisoners, parolees uh, and persons on the serious and sex offenders registers if they want to change the sex which is recorded on their birth certificate. A person can change their sex descriptor to anything as long as it is not offensive or obscene, too long, a symbol and can be reasonably established by repute or usage. So what does this mean? What are the direct and practical implications of someone being able to change the recorded sex on their birth certificate on the basis of a simple statutory declaration? And if we understand the law as a codification of society's moral values, what implications does this have for how society understands sex and gender? To address these questions and more, we have Dr Holly Lawford-Smith, a senior lecturer in political philosophy at Melbourne University, Hayden Opie, AM, senior fellow in the Melbourne Law School and a member of the Court of Arbitration of Sport, Virginia mansell Lees who is a lecturer in the Department of Social Work and Social Policy at the Trove University, Aubrey Wodonga, and Bronwyn Winter, a lesbian feminist activist and academic and the Deputy Director of European Studies at the University of Sydney. Thank you. We'll hear from Holly first.
Great. So um, some of the other panelists are going to talk more about the implications of this bill if it goes through. Um, what I want to focus on is this move of replacing sex, understood as a certain kind of embodiment, so either biological sex as observed at birth and recorded on the birth certificate, or um, something we can call altered sex, which is obtained via sex reassignment surgery, replacing this with, um, with belief about sex in the law. So you can see the relevant passage of the bill there. Um, I want to focus on this idea of belief about sex as the concept of gender identity, um, which many countries have either protected separately uh, or are attempting to replace sex with in the law. Um, we've protected it separately already, as you can see. Here's our Equal Opportunity Act and our Sex Discrimination Act, both of which feature protections for gender identity already. Um, and there are bills uh, proposed or about to go through in the UK, uh, in New Zealand, um, and here in Australia that are also attempting to get this notion in as um, sex. So the question I want to ask is, is gender identity fit to replace sex in the law? So to change this meaning from something that's embodied to, some, to something that's not about embodiment at all. Um, and I'm going to argue, um, you may be surprised to hear, that gender identity is not fit to replace sex in the law, and I'm going to draw on some recent work in philosophy to do so, which is my um, academic discipline. This is obviously just a 10-minute whirlwind, um, so I'm not going to be able to do justice to these uh, interesting and sophisticated arguments. I'm just going to try to give you them in a nutshell. So Talia May Betcher, first of all, is a trans woman philosopher. She says, uh, gender identity is something that we have first personal authority about, um, in that sense, it's like other mental states, like wishes or desires or pains or pleasures, uh, things that I'm generally considered to be an expert about compared to other people. She also says that gender identity is existential, so it's got something to do with who I really am, who we really are. Catherine Jenkins um, is an explicitly trans-allied feminist philosopher. She makes an analogy in two of her papers between a physical map that guides us um, through a particular terrain and this idea she has of an, an internal map uh, which guides us through the world when there are different expectations that bear upon different people. Um, so she says gender identity is a kind of internal map formed to guide people of a particular class, a gender class, through certain social and material realities. Um, and for Jenkins, we can have these internal maps, something guiding us through the world as women, uh, even while we violate the dictates of the map, so we don't go in the direction that it tells us to go, even while we disapprove of the map, um, and apparently even without others holding us to the sense that there's a map or um, that we should be going in those particular directions. Then finally, uh, Robin Dembroff is a non-binary philosopher. They say that both what gender identities we have and what those gender identities mean is up to us. So notice what that means. That means that um, there's no fact of the matter about what content a female slash woman slash feminine gender identity has. And it means that uh, it's not the case that everyone who has one has the same content. Rather, it means there can be as many meanings of that identity as there are people identifying and more. So notice the challenge that this poses um, for trying to argue that these identities are then in any sense the same as those that non-trans female people are argued to have. So look, these are all philosophers who are highly committed to trans rights and who are working really hard to defend a coherent idea of gender identity, um, in some, some cases explicitly for activist ends, so Jenkins in particular. So I think there is good a chance as we have um, at understanding this thing as any. And what they have in common is that they track something highly internal to a person, uh, her sense of who she really is, what her internal map is directing her to do, what it means to her to identify herself as a woman. Um, but notice that someone could have all of these internal features uh, without having any external features that would make others treat her as a woman. This is an entirely different thing to being embodied as female. So let's take this class. This is my uh, shit attempt at representing a class. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, these stars just suppose are male-born people with women slash female slash feminine gender identities, um, as understood on any of these three accounts that I've just presented. 
And then there's two interesting questions to ask. One, should the law be interested in this class of people? And two, should the law be interested in this class of people as members of the sex class they identify with or as? And I think the answer to the second question, at least, must be only if the reasons for why we have sex-based protections also apply to them. And I think we have these protections for three broad types of reasons. The first reason is to protect privacy. So, for example, when we say that um, sleeping accommodations can be maintained as single sex, as both the Australian Sex Discrimination Act and the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act do say. The second kind of reason is to protect fairness. So, for example, when we say that female sports can be maintained as single sex, as the Equal Opportunity Act does say. Um, and the third is to protect against discrimination and underrepresentation. For example, when we have single sex <laughs> scholarships, prizes, or hiring lists. Okay, so the question becomes um, do all or most people with female, women, feminine, gender identities need their privacy protected as female from male? Would it be unfair to require them to compete as female against male in sports? Have they generally been discriminated against? or underrepresented in certain areas as female compared with male? And it seems that in most cases, although with the occasional exception, the answer to these questions will be no. Certainly in the case of male-born trans people who have undergone no surgical and medical transition and have been through a male puberty, the answer will clearly be no in all three cases. So, we shouldn't be replacing sex in the law with gender identity through the notion of what sex one believes oneself to be rather than the fact of what sex one is or what sex one has taken surgical steps towards becoming. I think the answer to the first question is a little less obvious. So it seems to me that the law should be interested in this class of people, um, or at least a class of people that includes these people, such as any or all gender non-conforming people, because these people do sometimes face quite serious discrimination. But notice that uh, depending how we characterise this group, so whether we use gender identity or gender expression or gender non-conformity, we might already protect this. Um, so I already showed you in my second slide that gender identity is protected in both the Equal Opportunity Act and the Sex Discrimination Act. And if that's the case, then this bill that we're talking about is attempting to replace sex in the law with something that is already protected <laughs> in the law. And so this bill is only bad news for women rather than being uh, bad news for women, but good news for trans people. So in conclusion, let's not try to shoehorn the protection of gender identity uh, into the protection of sex. For as long as sex-based discrimination persists, women need sex-based rights. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming along. Uh, I'm going to take what I think is a fairly practical uh, explanation of the legal framework that governs the uh, question of um, discrimination in sport on grounds of sex and gender identity. Uh, I want to explain that framework. It is complex, but it gives a practical application to some of the issues which uh, we're discussing here this evening. And quickly, in terms of an overview, uh, generally discrimination is unlawful on the basis of sex or gender in sport. There is an exception, uh, as just been mentioned, for competitive sports where the strength, the stamina or the physique of competitors is relevant. The Victorian Bill will not affect that law, but sports have to manage the exception and the Bill will affect the way in which they manage the exception and I'd like to talk briefly about some of the grey areas. As I just said and has been uh, mentioned, uh, that there is, the laws uh, prohibit discrimination generally in sport, and there is this exception. It means, both under federal law and also under the state law, Equal Opportunity Act, single-sex sport is permitted. It is not discriminatory to have single-sex sport where the strength, stamina or physique of competitors is relevant. And if a person of the same sex 
say has gone through the process that the bill proposes uh, can be excluded because of their gender identity. The exception is very limited. It doesn't apply to non-competitive sporting activities. If you go for a round of golf or play tennis with your friends or beach cricket or kick to kick football, uh, it, the exception does not apply. Where there is competitive sport and where women have sufficient strength and the physique to match the men, to be competitive with them, then things like lawn bowls, darts, equestrian, rowing, jockeys, uh, sorry, coxes and rowing, motor racing, the exception doesn't apply. And it doesn't apply to coaching and administration and refereeing or umpiring. The bill will not amend those laws if it's passed, but it will have an impact in the sense that there will be a probable increase in the number of and diversity of people who will present and wish to participate in single sex sport for women, which is covered by that exception. And so sports have to consider how do they manage that. Sports do have existing regulations which are very uh, sizeable and in scope and impact to protect their members, uh, to promote inclusion, of whether it's on the basis of race or sex or something else, to prohibit bullying, to prohibit vilification and other forms of discriminatory conduct. And a number of sports, and we have seen today, Cricket Australia announced such a policy, uh, that there are specific transgender and gender diverse policies which are being developed or in the process of doing so, and that sporting bodies around the country are being encouraged to do that and supported in doing that by the Australian Human Rights Commission and Sport Australia, which is the federal government's body for regulating sport, and also with the support of the Coalition of Major Professional and Participation Sports. This is where it gets a little bit difficult in terms of managing the exception. The idea of looking at strength, stamina and physique invokes biological sex, not one's legal sex, not one's gender. And the basis for that, which is commonly put, is that males will have a significant <coughs> physiological advantage over the generic male will have a significant physiological advantage over the generic female. And so in order to create and preserve a space for women to compete in sport, in this type of sport, then this law is necessary. There are some grey areas with the law. What is competitive sport? Uh, what exactly does strength, stamina or physique encompass and mean? Which sports come within that exception? And relevant to what? Is it to winning? Is it to competing effectively? Those are some of the grey areas which the law has not yet definitively resolved and will be a matter of fact to be determined on a sport by sport basis. So what do sports do about this? Uh, and I've just put here some of the options which have been considered and discussed in a practical sense. One of the first things you could do is just simply say that people who do not qualify as biological females cannot participate in sports for females, or for women. They're just out. And that's simple. It's, however, non-inclusive. And for people who have made the transition and the deep commitment which that may involve, that's going to be very difficult for them. If Sport is an important part of their social life and existence. It will be very unfair in individual cases, in the sense that a person may um, have made that sort of com commitment and will not be competitive in sports for other people. Uh, but it does protect that female space for the biological woman. Alternatively, the other extreme, the blanket inclusion. It's simple. It addresses some of the concerns about exclusion that I just mentioned. However, it's going to be resisted, particularly by elite female athletes 
who are increasingly vocal about protecting what they see as their space from people who they cannot compete with because of the advantages conferred by testosterone. So do you take a, a midway position and you include some people uh, within the scope of the exception on a sub-individual assessment basis, subject to conditions? We, that needs to be specific to the sport because each sport will have different elements, different characteristics, and indeed um, it will involve a, a very specific assessment of the individual. Uh, the fear is that this will create a bureaucracy that has to decide these sorts of things, that it is very uncertain, and we see sports grappling with the idea of, well, how much testosterone is too much? Uh, where do you draw the line? And the sports differ. They greatly differ in what they are implementing in terms of the detail of their regulations, and the devil is in the detail. Uh, the, it is been, for some people, a long and convoluted and difficult and brutal process for a trans woman to establish that she is appropriately included in a sport for women, for biological women. And the, the experience of the Canadian athlete, Kirsten uh, Worley, who um, was the first to go through the International Olympic Committee's process, uh, demonstrates that that can be very brutal and damaging and that her health suffered because she needed some testosterone for health, but she wasn't able to get any. Other ideas are to say, well, look, elite sport, we will uh, exclude the transgender person. Uh, lower community levels, we won't. We will be inclusive. Where's the line between the two? Where it assumes that you know, if you play in the B-grade pennant competition tennis, uh, then winning doesn't matter as much for someone who's higher up the level. Uh, so that is a problem which needs to be resolved. Some people talk about the physical safety of competitors being mismatched. Maybe there are other solutions to that. And another possible solution is to say, well, there's to be one competition for biological females and an open competition for everybody else. <laughs> that would enable women who want to compete against men to do so. And there are many who do want to do that to test themselves. So this is very much a work in progress. The guidelines issued by the Australian Human Rights Commission don't go into that sort of detail. They leave it to sports to work it out. And what has to happen is we need to have a debate and engagement. There's a lot of scientific evidence to be gathered and used and a lot of consultation to be engaged in. So it's a work in progress. So thank you for your attention. different perspective. Uh, I think that we are faced consistently uh, in a world where things are changing uh, almost sort of by the hour. So sometimes it's very hard to get your head around what it actually means. Consistently, gender, gender identity, sexuality are conflated. So for the ordinary person to try and disentangle those things, it takes quite a bit. Uh, and so consequently, often people feel silenced because they're unsure of how to approach these particular things, so they don't say anything. What that's allowed is a huge amount of misinformation, and I think the misinformation does none of us any good. Because what it does is it leads a whole range of people off in questioning their own sort of ability to understand what's happening, creates divisions between us that don't really need to be there. Part of my work uh, as a unionist uh, is I work a lot with people. I'm the acute uh, queer unionist in tertiary education convener nationally for the National Tertiary Education Union. 
and we have all sorts of people within our cute caucus. We don't ask questions about who you are. If you believe you want to be a member of the caucus, you are, uh, because that's the way in which we want to operate. If we take that one step further, then what is it that's actually stopping us from being able to work collectively and come up with different ways? I believe very strongly that women's sex-based rights must be protected because if we protect that, then from there emanates a whole range of other protections for all people within society. Rights in and of themselves have many different sort of ways of operating and I like to think about rights as having responsibilities and they're two sides of the one coin. And when we think about that, uh, what we need to be able to understand and articulate to ourselves and to others is what that actually looks like. I think the changes, proposed changes to the legislation are very narrow and I think what they will end up doing is creating a range of very unforeseen uh, circumstances. Uh, any legislative change has the, you know, the ability for that to happen and we've seen many instances of totally contradictory things coming out because of the way in which it's interpreted. I think that uh, if we don't uh, think about what all of those terms mean uh, and we're constantly trying to unpack them, then we're not looking at how we actually work together collectively. I'm much more interested in having good and robust relationships with others where we can agree to disagree but we can work on things jointly because that's my life, that's the way in which I operate. I'm a social work academic so I teach uh, young people, older people, to be social workers. I'm at the end part of my uh, career and have felt myself very privileged for the work that I've done. One of the things that I love about being an academic is all of the younger people who come in who are questioning